Good morning, it still is just. We're nearly off air. Um, uh, we've got an hour's worth, as Patrick says, of distance to run, and this extraordinary event. I've been interested in this territory now for a very long time. I've never seen an event which has brought different groups, different attitudes together in this way to look at the future rather than moan about the present. It includes moaning about the present, of course. Um, at the end, at the beginning of the programme, for many months now, I always told panellists, turn your mobile phones off. And then when you get on air, um, um, I heard a phone. I looked along with a sort of degree of irritation at the panel, who's left their phone on, until I realised it was me. <laughs> I threw it over my shoulder in panic, picked it up afterwards and discovered that, uh, mercifully, it was intact and there was a message on it. And the message was from someone who knows the programme is live, who is a, who is a well-known as a broadcaster and has been to the programme. And the message said simply, Jonathan, thought you'd like to know I'm really enjoying the show. <laughs> what I have never said until this moment, and he disputes the facts, um, he would, um, who it is that was that person. It was one Patrick Holden. <laughs> anyway, our first question comes from David Exwood. David, oh, and to the questioners, I'd be grateful if you restrict yourself to the question rather than to a homily to build up to the question. <laughs> so my question is, are high farming yields the enemy of nature? Are high farming yields the enemy of nature? President of the NFU, Manette Batters. I think we are embracing, and I think this morning showed that this is about a new future. Um, this is about the UK, this is about building frameworks between the four countries. We're four countries, we're one nation, and we have to agree on a framework. So for me, this is a conversation about the future. The policy is going to be very, very different to that of the past. But I think we showed today that working with scientists, working with the academic community, that we really can shape that future. Does that mean that you can do it consistently with being a friend of nature and having high farming yields? The question. I, I, don't th I think there's a big difference between a high yield. You know, high yields is not a bad thing. And there's a lot of things that we are doing when you look at how, you know, we've changed our, our complete focus is now on soils, in a way that it never has been before. So that is all boosting yields, driving huge change now. We look at precision farming, new technologies, you know, lowering our inputs all the time. But you constantly, yes, want to be able to effectively, you know, achieve more, produce more, but focus on impacting less at all times. So success shouldn't be about downsizing yield. It should be about smarter, climate smart farming. Michael, Michael Lee, nutritionist, and scientist. Yeah, um, <clears throat> chasing any single metric is damaging to sustainability. And if that sole metric is yield, then that is not going to be the most sustainable way of producing food. And that's not to say that high yields are anti-nature because there are many examples where a high yielding production, farming producing practice will be more efficient in terms of nutrient use. But of course, we need to look at other aspects of that systems. It's about input-output balance and utilizing resources. And the most critical resource on any farm is the soil. And giving the farmers the tools to optimize the flow of nutrients from soil into food is what will drive yield uh, patterns. So it's about armoring uh, farmers with the knowledge of the capacity of their land and not over-utilising that land with um, inorganic inputs which are not sustainable. D Dieter Helm was talking earlier about uh, polluters must pay. At the moment, uh, high yields are generally, not inevitably, but generally associated with the use of uh, carbon in terms of fertiliser use and so on, whether it's... Uh, uh, ruminants or whether it's uh, arable. How does the, do you, do you believe it to be the case that you can have farming high yields without, given what you said about the soil, without high fertilizer usage? It came up yesterday evening in, a, in quite a sort of direct way in conversation. So I, I always say to, in, in, in my research group that the, the 
the drive of chemical agriculture is weaning and the drive for biological agriculture is increasing. And of course, there's going to be a tipping point where biological agriculture will meet and pass chemical agriculture. But there, it's about working in harmony with soil nutrients, soil biology, and plants, looking at natural nitrogen fixation, there's looking at multifunctional swords, relearning some of the expertise that we had in the past, but not just being constrained by that, we can advance it. So at the moment, no, I don't think we can deliver the yields that we currently have with biological agriculture from chemical agriculture, but we're working on it. When has it, uh, DEFRA, uh, the, the Chief Scientific Officer, uh, <laughs> advisor to the government, uh, produced this concept of sustainable intensification. He uh, produced this, and I, I, every time I look out at a train window, I, I think, what does he mean? And if you're going up the East Coast main line and you look out across a 400-acre field, planted close to a hedgerow, close to a watercourse, probably, not necessarily, but probably a wildlife desert, the answer to your question is, is no. But I went to, uh, I, I've been to in East, also in East Anglia, to a uh, horticultural farm which is producing high quality potatoes and other uh, uh, other products next door to a, an amazing wildlife network which is intrinsically involved with it because of water uh, and, and so I, so I think that it's impossible to answer it precisely but on, on my farm uh, there are corners of fields which I can match off with the tram lines and not farm or not farm as intensively uh, and plant wildflowers or do whatever I want to do, plant trees. Uh, and without massively reducing the potential of that field. And I think that there is so much, and so many organizations represented here today are leading farmers down a, a route where you can still maintain a good gross margin off the same acreage while doing sensible things in the margins or elsewhere in the field that, that, that balance it. So the answer is it can be done but it's not always perfect. Well, I think it's a very challenging question because and my initial answer to it is that I, I want on my farm to produce as much food as I possibly can. So I'm more of a farmer than a conservationist in that sense. But I think the reason why it's difficult to answer is because we haven't got an accounting system which, takes, which includes the balance sheet of nature, of natural capital and of human capital, in relation to the productivity of our farms. And because of that, farmers have been forced uh, to go for a profit because the balance sheet hasn't been valued. And I think the conversation in the last session should lead to a proper valuation of the impact, impact of our farming system on biodiversity, on soil carbon, on all the other measurements of the natural capital balance sheet. And if that was the case, within those constraints of not degrading the balance sheet that we are having stewardship over, we should go for producing as much nutrient-dense food as possible because that's our role as farmers. So I think this conference needs to lead to the emergence of a proper balance sheet. Thank you. Um, it's, not, it's not your mastermind... Next, it's not your mastermind territory, Tom Watson. You've been... You said you'd be on a learning curve coming here. But when you, when you hear that question, what is your response to it? Well, Jonathan, thank you for setting me up to explain to this audience why I am the least qualified person in this room. <laughs> and I just want to say to you all, I love this conference. I love the debates. I love what you're doing. Every fact that has been shared today is new to me. And hopefully I'll get time to explain to you why my health journey has got me into almost an obsessive interest in food production and the realisation that we need a paradigm shift in thinking in public policy. Uh, but my head is not full of enough facts to give you an erudite uh, and wise answer. But I will tell you this. It doesn't usually stop a politician. It doesn't, and, it, <laughs> and it's not going to now. In my obsessional world, the crazy world of Brexit white noise, the crazy world of parties divided than the Labour Party. Food production really fascinates me. And there's this guy from Japan called Fukuoka, I've said that wrong, who wrote The One Straw Revolution. And this guy has blown my mind. Right? And he says, the ultimate goal of farming is not the growing of crops, 
but the cultivation and perfection of human beings. And he goes on to say, food and medicine are not two different things. They are front and back of one body. Now, I started looking at this when I read a fact, when I was reading research on nutrition, that said 50% of humanity in the West, of, of the Western world is deficient in magnesium because we've drained magnesium out of the soils. And I thought to myself, how have we let that happen? Why am I buying magnesium supplements when I could be eating it in the food supply? And then I started digging around and realised, as Gail said, my fellow Yorkshire-born miners' lineage radical. It's all fucked up. <laughs> and so uh, I would say to you, uh, obviously, don't take my answer for gospel. Uh, but actually, what we need is nutritious, as nutri nutrient-dense food. Uh, and actually, at the heart of this is keeping people healthy. Uh, and so your yield should be as high as possible whilst not draining everything we need to survive as humans on the planet. Not bad for the new kid on the block. <laughs> <laughs> the next question we'll go straight to, which is from Ken, Ken Stebbings. How can we encourage consumers to pay more for their food? How can we encourage consumers, is the question, to pay more for their food, which has been embedded in part of the discussion in relation to food. I, 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 I'm going to get politicians first on this, because it's a, you know, how do you get consumers to pay more for their food? There's a built-in assumption that they should pay more from their, for, their, for their food. Richard, Ben. So a politician saying we want you to pay more uh, for your household expenditure is usually a politician who'd be looking for a new career. But the, uh, the, the truth behind your question is that as a proportion of household spending, food has never been cheaper. That's not quite true. It's just started to pick up as a percentage. But it, it is, it, compared with decades ago, it has never been less. I, I would broaden it, actually, to food and water. To make people value something, it has to be, have a fundamental effect. Now, there are ways of reducing household expenditure in a whole range of ways. You can, you can cap electricity prices and various other things. I think if you just look at food uh, and, uh, and you just say, you know, for the sake of our planet, we've got to increase uh, the cost of food, I think then you're, you're making a mistake. And what I'd say to Gail this morning is I just absolutely loved her, her talk. But I think of my constituents who are broadly sympathetic with her and me and everybody else who minds about the climate and what we're doing to this planet. But they're also busy. They're taking their children to school. They're paying their mortgage. They want to survive in a competitive, uh, difficult world. And we, to carry them with us, we've got to make it look possible. We've got to make it look doable. Uh, and that's why I think work such as being done by Adair Turner and the uh, Transition Commission, is showing that you can do this at a cost that is not absolutely destroying people's livelihoods and making us all go and live in a cave. So it can be done. Uh, I think food to be valued, along with other inputs in our lives, uh, probably does have to rise, but politicians have to manage that with reducing other burdens on people, whether that's through taxation or other forms of cost. Tom Watson. Uh, I represent one of the poorest constituencies in the country, West Bromwich, uh, and we have food poverty there. And um, one of the saddest events I remember, there are two. The first is a 12-year-old child describing to me the physical effects of feeling starvation, the tingling in the tummy, the sort of lightheadedness, when they, didn't, they lived in a household that couldn't afford to eat. And the second was when I went to a primary school and the teacher was explaining to five-year-olds what an apple, an orange and a pear was because they lived in a household uh, didn't, and didn't know the names of fruit. And at the time I'd left my one-year-old pointing at the fruit bowl because he was beginning to have pieces of uh, orange and the sort of thing you give kids when they're growing up. So I think the answer to this is choice. Uh, there are some people that can afford to pay 
for their food in Borough Market, like me, when I get my 6,000 steps in in the morning market. I, uh, Jonathan, I walk down from Westminster and I buy my fresh produce. Uh, because uh, we cannot ignore the fact that we now live in a country where people really can't afford food. And I think the bigger policy challenge, though, is to get people eating different kinds of food. The health journey I've been on, I've lost a lot of weight, I've kicked diabetes, I've got rid of obesity, my, my blood pressure is now in the normal range, and I've done that nutritionally. And I've done it by eating grass-fed organic beef, <laughs> salted butter, lovely nitrate-free bacon cooked in butter with eggs in the morning. It's absolutely transformed my life. I'm calmer than I've ever been, but I can afford that, and some people can't. Uh, I've met the British Egg and Industrial Council this week. I now know that we eat 199 eggs each on average a year. I want to eat 499 eggs a year. I've got seven bantam chickens that I've grown in the that I've bought in the last year because I love eggs. I want people to know the joy of real food. I kicked processed food and started eating real food. And that's our public policy challenge to find a way that people can have a nutritional supply of healthy food that makes them well again. Because I started this journey I want to eradicate, there are 2 million people in this country with type 2 diabetes who the research from Newcastle University says could get off their meds and, and reverse their condition. The cognitive gains for this nation can, are immense if we can give people their lives back through doing that and we're going to do it with food supply. Uh, so I, I don't know. Uh, there are people who can't afford to pay more for food, but I know it is a government challenge to make sure that we can change food production and food supply so that we can halt the rise of non-communicable diseases, give people their lives back, and give them the joy of eating grass-fed organic beef Tom. and not feel guilty about it. <coughs> If, if, you, if you think of those of your constituents who are uh, the low incomes, uh, food poverty, and um, uh, disproportionately prone to diabetes type 2, disproportionately prone to heart disease, cancers, ob obesity-based, as you were obese, can you imagine a situation... Because it takes... That's a very personal question. It takes quite a lot of strength of character to say, I'm going to change my diet because I know I will feel better at the end of the journey, doesn't it? <laughs> One of the things I want to do is change public health advice because obviously I ignored the advice of my government. Uh, and the truth is we live in a sugar economy and people have got too much sugar in their, in their diet. Uh, and when I started reading the science, uh, you know, when I stopped being frightened of saturated fat, when I kicked sugar, Taking saturated fat in my diet stopped me being hungry. Uh, and I'd been hungry every minute of every hour of every day for 30 years. I just thought I was a glutton, that I was greedy. As it happened, I was a refined sugar addict. And when I got rid of that, it was the easiest thing I've ever done. And I'm the most chilled out I've ever been. I'm happy, I'm calm, and in my job, that's a miracle. <laughs> uh, I sit there every day in the shadow cabinet, sit next to Jeremy at PMQs. The world's perfect we, for we'd me. Like, we'd like to hear... It's a shame we haven't got time. We'd love to hear a bit more about those shadow cabinet meetings. But I know we can't really do that. Let me, I better move on. Michael. Price of food is extremely difficult. You know, if we've got control of our wallets, we can make the decision. Um, but there's many, many people uh, in the UK who sadly can't. Uh, this is where we need really good politicians uh, to be able to support those individuals. And it's unfortunate that the least nutritious food, uh, processed food, is the cheapest. Um, so we need to have, and I think the key to this, starting with, is education, um, ensuring that education at school level all the way through is on understanding nutrition and food production. I think one of our earlier speakers said there's no bad 
food commodities as does bad diet. So it's about understanding from principles why we choose what we eat and, what it, um, and how we set up our eat well plate. So therefore in, in we relative, need to... In, rel in relative terms, does that mean, to go back to the question, having to pay relatively more for your food than you do at present, or can you shift without having to pay the financial price of that shift? I, I think we do need to pay more for higher quality. You know, the question earlier was about yield again, but yield just driven on dry matter doesn't account for the nutrient content of that um, food. You know, wheat yields have been growing year on year, but the micronutrient content of that wheat has been dropping year on year. So therefore, we need to think about the nutritional content and pay a little bit more for higher quality. But also that means we need to responsibly consume and I don't think we've educated enough on why we should be eating what products. As I said, agriculture is the health industry. The NHS is supporting us when things go wrong. If we get the principles of agriculture right, then we should have um, um, a healthier population. And at the moment, you know, in a perfect balanced grouping, our agricultural production should mimic what we should consume on an eat well plate. And they don't. They are far from skewed, so therefore we need to, to readdress uh, what we actually produce to align with production. And that will mean um, uh, paying more for higher nutrition. But also, critically, and Tom made the point, we need good politicians and good support for the people who can't pay and ensure that apples, good quality red meat, um, uh, good quality leafy green vegetables are available to those people and they know what to do with them. Patrick. Well, I strongly agree with what Michael um, has said. Um, I think the only point I could add to it is I think we need to make food uh, pricing honest because present food pricing, it goes back to Dieter's points in the last panel, uh, doesn't reflect its true cost of production, either the impact on the environment or public health. And if uh, producers were financially responsible for that damage, then the price of so-called cheap food, which appears cheap in the shops but isn't really, would go up, because it would just be honest. So if we were able to apply those, that principle that Dieter has determined that we should that the government should introduce, I think that would be correct a lot of these apparent distortions. And by the way, I'm not sure if it's available, but we've just upgraded our report, which was published in 2017, The Hidden Costs of UK Food. And uh, I think there are a few copies here. If they're not, they're going to be available within a day or two. And the, the headline thing is for every pound that we spend on food in the shops, there's a hidden pound in damage to the environment and public health split 50-50. So let's get a handle on those co uh, costs and say, have a campaign to make food pricing honest, and I think that would self-correct a lot of these problems. Inside, we can't go there, but just what you said is interesting, because it, it's conceivable to deal with the kind of issues that uh, Tom was, was, was talking about and Rich was talking about, um, that you, you can, that extra pound could be borne by general taxation in a way that doesn't therefore hit those on the lowest incomes Hardest. Anyway, um, Minette, Can I just say one thing? Yeah, but I think yeah. it's right for governments to introduce measures to make sure that good quality food is available to all low-income groups, and that's a different issue. Uh, it's a related issue, yeah. but we can make food pricing honest, and if it's honest, then, then we can, we'll deal with the problem if some of the lower-income groups haven't got enough money to buy food, but it should be treated as a separate issue. We, we have, we only very for a moment, momentarily, we touched on um, supermarkets, but... The assumption, there's almost an assumption, is can we get people to pay more? Uh, core to this are the supermarkets who are really in control of the, in large measure, in control of the prices that the farmer gets at the gate for their produce, isn't it? Look, I said, didn't I, in my talk, it won't be long before we get on to food inflation, we'll, we'll sort all of this out. This is, this is so hugely complex, and what you do about it is even more complex. So it's, it's nice to have conversations around education and, you know, encouraging people to, to, to grade up, if you like. But we've got the most extraordinary situation going on at the moment with a massive added value area of vegan products. So if we talk about soya milk, almond milk as an example, things that are being traded globally are being painted as the savior of the planet while livestock is the poisoner of the planet. 
And this is, I think, partly come about because successive governments, and I think the blame rests with, with everybody, actually, have allowed a totally unique retailer monopoly buying power. So we have a globally completely unique market. Now, many of you will remember when we tried to deliver one penny, one penny per litre of milk back to farmers. My God, it caused meltdown. And competition law came wading down on everybody and said no. And so if we are serious about this, then government absolutely has to get involved. And I have said to Michael Gove, and it'll be the first thing I say to a new Secretary of State if Michael Gove isn't there, is we need a complete review of the agri-food value chain. You're in a place where farmers are taking less than 7% out of that value chain. And we need a review done. It should not be done by the Competition and Markets Authority. And when I mentioned it to Michael, he said he felt this was a job for Treasury. But this is really big stuff. And we can have the nice conversations about education, but if you don't challenge the functionality of that supply chain, you will continue with the same problem. And with Brexit looming, it's even more important. The other thing I'd say that really backs up what Tom said is a code of practice on advice. If you are a consumer and you are having these vegan projects being portrayed as being the saviour of the planet, and the huge added value when you look into it of these things that are moving around the world without tariff restrictions that the rest of us as producers of commodities face, we have to challenge that. So a code of practice on advice. You talk about retail, Jonathan. We all are fixated about retail. What about out of home? It is a black abyss and it is bigger than retail. And we absolutely need codes of practice that are informing an honest debate about what we are eating out of home. Thank you. <laughs> we must, we must uh, uh, press on. Let's go next, I think, to Neil Heseltine. Yeah. Neil. As we move towards net zero, Will a farm's ability to sequester carbon and deliver biodiversity be of greater value to society and therefore to the farmers and land managers than the food it produces? As we go forward, will a farm's ability to sequester carbon and deliver biodiversity be of greater value to society uh, than the food that the farmers produce? I can see one member of the audience weighing in the balance the, uh, the, 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 the question. Um, it, it, why don't you start on this, Michael Lee? Oh, it's, it's a great question. Um, and when I'm talking to farmers at the moment and thinking about the future, you know, we think about their business as delivering food and public goods. We, farm, farming has to deliver both. Um, we don't want our farmers just to be national parks. We want them to produce high quality food. We heard brilliantly from Dieter today about the role that UK agriculture should be playing in food production. We have a perfect environment for producing high quality food. Um, we need to support the industry to do that. Um, so I, I can't say that you can say one is more important than the other. Um, I think a farmer would say actually food production is going to be the most important thing that they deliver. But the caring of that land, ensuring we've got clean water, clean air, biodiversity. You know, the fant I was talking again to Natural England about uh, the importance of hedgerows for hedgehogs and what would happen if we lost all our grassland farms um, in a world without livestock. You know, we're doing some research at the moment at Northwick about what the true impact will be of ploughing up the southwest grasslands and trying to plant arable crops and what the impact would be on biodiversity. So there's a clear view that actually, no, it isn't just food production. It's got to be working with um, the environment. So they are both so important. That's the importance of our farmers. Uh, I wouldn't like to see a, a trade-off between the two. Uh, I, I'm trying to develop... Uh, ideas around the four parts per thousand, which some of you, many will be familiar with, which is this concept of increasing the organic matter in the soil to increase the sequestration powers of the soil uh, and to increase your productivity at the same time. And so it's not a mutually exclusive. It can be entirely beneficial. And what we're seeing through ideas such as that is, is the developing ideas around uh, uh, around better food production rather than more food production. Uh, and using our natural environment and our soils uh, as carbon sinks, 
at the same time as being productive. And it sort of very much fits into what Dieter and others were saying earlier. Uh, ultimately, it drives you down various paradoxical routes. So, for example, for that to work, you need to have grass as part of the rotation. Now, all my 20-something children's woke friends are going vegan on a massive uh, scale. Uh, and I gently point out to them that actually they shouldn't. That if they eat sustainably produced uh, beef from grass lays, they will actually be doing more to save the planet than they would be uh, by not eating meat what at all. Re what reasons do they give? Because obviously there's this huge wave of, of, of veganism. It's a sort of like the seventh wave. What reasons do they give? Is it that they think they're saving the planet? Is it that they don't uh, like killing? Is it that they don't like meat? The, I mean, most of them are doing it are very impressive people, much more impressive than my generation when we were that age. We just sort of did what we wanted. They, these are people who really mind about, uh, uh, these are the same children who come on Fridays once a month to my office to talk about climate change. Uh, these are people who we've got to listen to. But they've got to understand that everything has an impact. Uh, it's like the glyphosate uh, issue. You know, if you were just to ban glyphosate, what impact would that have on our ability to run proper rotational agricultural systems which increase worm production, which allow us to have a better chance of sequestering the carbon we need to while feeding people better? So it's a message we need to get out about quality and the kind of choices people need to make. It's not a binary one. I don't know the answer. The answer is all of that, Jonathan, actually. Some of them are, do mind about you know, killing animals, but others... They are the best informed generation that has ever existed. On their phone, they can tell you tomorrow, in 15 seconds, what the gross national product of Guatemala is. But they need to understand that their choices are, have impacts. And uh, I think we've got to be better at explaining it. Um, Patrick, you might just pick up on the glyphosate thing in the context of your answer too. The necessity for glyphosate used properly otherwise, dot, dot, dot. Well, I, th I think that came up enough last night, but what I would say is Not that everyone here was here okay, last well, night. Um, I, think it is, I think it is true to say, and I know this from my own experience, that producing arable crops, particularly vegetables in my case, but also other arable crops, uh, in long runs without glyphosate is very difficult. Even with an, a rotation which includes a fertility building level, a, a, a time of grass, it's still challenging. But I do, I personally believe that it's only a matter of time before glyphosate will be banned um, because there is growing evidence, as was said last night, that it has undesirable effects on the soil and on public health. Uh, but is it, I also, think is it also increasing ineffective against black grass or whatever it's called? Actually, it could just be not used because it's not working. Herbicide resistance is an, is, is an issue with glyphosate, but also other herbicides. Yeah. But I just think... It, 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 we're talking about a transition period here, and I think that's the key. But I want to go back to yeah. what Richard said about four per thousand. Uh, at the moment, our net income, for average net income, Minette will correct me if I'm wrong, is about the same as our direct payment in pillar one, 80 pounds an acre or whatever. So if you were to say to farmers, uh, if you build soil carbon, you can keep that 80 pounds an acre, and if you don't, you might lose it, because that's where I think the money ought to go into sustainable farming, not into stewardship. Uh, I think a lot of farmers would, that would provide a sufficient incentive for farmers to start to switch their farming systems back towards rotational farming, which would start to relieve them of the challenge they have of weed control. Being paid, uh, we, I think it was touched on earlier this morning, being paid directly yeah. for sequestering yeah. if, carbon. If, if you could say to farmers, if you build carbon or maintain carbon, you get a, a, a fair chunk of the 80 pounds an acre, and if you don't, you lose it. I think that if that's like a proxy for so many other benefits, and I think it would be a, a potentially transformative policy instrument to deliver the changes we've been talking about this morning. Minette and then Tom. Minette. Well, look, to the, to the question, you can't have one without the other. They are intrinsically linked, and I think that's the key point. And, and to Richard, you know, we, we can't...
can't carry on with this gentle persuasion of the constituency. I mean, we, livestock farming is under the cosh like it has never been before. And if anybody doubts that, listen to my interview with Evan Davis, who opened the discussion up, bearing in mind it was on the food strategy, um, and, and set, compared the livestock industry with the tobacco industry. Is eating meat the new smoking? This can't be a gentle conversation any longer. It is absolutely pressing right here, right now. We need advice on diet. We need government to take it seriously. And we really need them to stand up for our industry. Otherwise, we are going to do untold harm to health. I agree, the next generation, Generation Z, by the way, we've been through millennials, snowflakes, we're on to Generation Z. They care and they want to be informed and they must be informed honestly. And I'll go back to what I said about these added value, even uh, vegan products that really have a huge, huge amount of global multinational money behind them. And we really need the honest advice about diet out there and livestock being part of the solution, a huge part of the solution. You can't have the cycle running effectively without it um, than where we are at the moment. So let's end the gentle debate on this and let's have real firm um, codes of practice in place on advice on diet. Tom, stop being so. <laughs> stop being so laid back, gentle, and at ease. Get on the case now. Okay, there is an axiom in politics that you should never fight a battle on too many fronts, and I've got enough trouble with the B word. I'm definitely not getting into the G word argument. Right, the size of these NFU guys at the front here, I'm just not going to do it. Right, <laughs> so I'm not touching glyphosate. Right. But your answer, uh, your, your question, goes to the point that a lot of the speakers this morning have said, is that you can't have a single target because there's always detrimental impacts in other areas. You've got to, obviously, look to both. And you can tell that I'm kind of on... I'm sort of... I've got some nascent ideas that aren't fully formed yet, which is why I'm here to come from people. But the, the one thing I absolutely understand is that when you change the way you grow and produce your food, you change the food. We change society. We change our values. And obviously, over time, those values change. You, you know, as well as, on a, as well as being on a mission to end type 2 diabetes for 2 million people, every time I meet my daughter, my 11-year-old, fiercely clever daughter, Saoirse, she says to me, what have you done to save the planet this week, Daddy? <laughs> right. Now, that is a big consumer demand. Uh, and that's why I'm here today. And so, of course, you can't ignore the challenges ahead. Uh, uh, but neither can government leave you to do it alone. Uh, and, and I think we would all agree that in these difficult times in a divided country and the white noise of Brexit, you know, farming is going to change dramatically. Uh, and you need partnership with the state. Uh, and one of the things I say to politicians, I say to these new, new young politicians, you read any memoir in the last 50 years, you know, the truth is that a lot of politicians are disappointed when they were posted to the Minister of Agri Ministry of Agriculture or DEFRA. If I had been elected two years ago, this would be the department I want, because it's going to be absolutely central to everything in our lives for the next half century. It's the most exciting department to have, and I'm pushing that next generation to try and get in there. And you can't just not, you can't just ignore it. You need to fill your head with facts, and dare I say, opinions, even if it involves eventually forming a view on the use of glyphosate. <laughs> but critically as well, because I think this is a major point, there's so much misinformation available at the moment. You know, there's so much lack of high quality, trustworthy nutritional advice. This is the danger. All, all, all this um, uh, imbalance about the role that livestock products are having in healthy eating is driven by the amount of trash that's out there on the internet. And I don't know how we actually saw it. Until we find a safe place to go that people can trust and know that they can trust to go there to get the nutritional advice, we're always going to have these issues. I uh, spent three or four years in DEFRA. It was the most exciting, interesting place I've ever worked, full of really passionate civil servants. But what's so bonkers about the way we do government, I promise this is relevant to the question, is that I, while I was there, I, I 
wrote a, something called the Natural Environment White Paper, out of which came Dieter Helm's Natural Capital Committee, among other things. And I had to go around the other departments. I went to the Department of Health to talk about food health and uh, uh, pre preventative health and how we can work together. Uh, I went to the Education Department to try, and, and there was very much, what on earth are you doing here? Uh, you, you know, this is our bag. Uh, uh, and what we are talking about in this room today covers almost every department of government. And somehow we've got to just get out of this impossible silo thinking if we're going to resolve some of these issues. Sometimes when politicians say, I promise you this rates directly to the question, you know that something is going to be diverted down another route, something they feel they need to say. In that case, it was absolutely pertinent. What a relief. We're going to go to Tom Bradshaw's question. Um, the UK farming industry is showing huge commitment to the challenge of climate change, while other, others around the world are in denial. How can, how can the UK compete with substandard imports if we don't apply tariffs, which is so politically sensitive? Huge issue of the moment and beyond. And for those who didn't hear at the back, the UK farming industry is showing huge commitment to the challenge of climate change, while others around the world do not. How can the UK compete with substandard imports if we don't apply tariffs? Um, where should we start? Who would like to start with that? You would, Manette. Um, look, this is the, the whole point. I, I get challenged on so many platforms. Can't you be more positive about no deal? No, I can't, and no, I won't be. My job is to be honest. If we leave in an orderly manner, we can negotiate future free trade agreements whereby if we enshrine in law, in the agricultural bill, what we want on food standards going forwards, then this is all within the art of the possible. Everything is, is perfectly achievable on that basis. If we leave with no deal, you can do none of that. You trade on WTO terms and you are then just subjected to whatever raw ingredients choose to come through the door. Now the critical danger, and I have heard, and I shan't say which minister, but you'll have heard plenty of them saying Brexit is the opportunity because we can bring in cheap raw ingredients and add value to them under the Union Jack. You know, this is the issue of our time, and every single one of you in this room has a duty to make sure that it doesn't happen. We've had the tariff schedule published in the event of a no deal, and the entire arable sector is left out, and there is no excuse for leaving it out. We should have reciprocal tariffs in place. There is no excuse. So this is a massive issue. If we don't get this bit right, we can't deliver on the many other things that we need to deliver on is the issue of our time right now. And I am absolutely distraught and angered that I have written to Boris Johnson. I've had a reply from Jeremy Hunt. I've had no reply from Boris Johnson on what he plans for the most impacted sector by Brexit. Richard Bennett. Uh, one of the reasons I was closely involved with uh, helping Rory Stewart was that I thought he was telling the truth on this issue. Uh, and in a three-year period since the referendum, uh, truth has been a, an increasingly rare concept right across the piece. I, I, I can't add anything to what Minette has said. I agree entirely with her. And I'm a, I'm a constituency MP like all the other 649, and I have to look in the eyes of people, whether they are machinery part uh, manufacturers exporting, or whether they are sheep farmers uh, ex uh, exporting. I need to think of them uh, when we take this decision. And I understand, I, of course I understand, there'll be people in this room who are fed up with Brexit, and I'm with you. I am totally fed up with it. I want to move on and talk about other things. And the next thing that people go in their minds is, well, let's just do it. Let's just get out, and we can sort it out later. And I have to say to them, look, I have looked into the eyes of businessmen and women. I have spoken to civil servants. I've seen the ashen faces of ministerial colleagues who've had briefings on this. I can't support no deal. Let, let, me, let, me ask you, let me ask you one more on that, to touch on what Manette says. The, 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 if there is a deal, you can then 
theoretically negotiate a trade deal and tariffs with every other country. Well, you, depends how you do it. If you either go on to WE terms, but you, or you negotiate but nation by, by nation. The time scale for that, if that is um, the outcome, is how long in your estimation? We, get, we, we, know, we know it's being told it's two years. Most people believe it's at least three, four, five, maybe 10 years to sort it out. Because it, it, sometimes and sometimes, oh, it's going to be so long. The, the argument has moved dramatically, hasn't it? So it's, the wonderful world before us is the one in which we leave with a deal, and that's terrific and fantastic, and the terrible world is leaving without a deal. There used to be an argument which said leaving at all is going to have huge challenges. Well, it took us... It, 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 I'm not allowed to... Well, actually, I'm free to express my views. <laughs> you are now. Uh, it took, but it, I didn't do it in this context. It took us 12 years to get into the common market. Uh, and it took the next 46 years to embed our laws, our regulations, how we manage our environment, how we keep our population safe. It was always going to be complicated to unravel that. And anyone who pretended it wasn't was not telling the truth. Yeah. I think in the bell curve of public opinion, you've got on the, the, the smaller minority on one end who got up every morning and thought, what can I do today to get out of the European Union? And on the other end, you've got people who are grieving uh, for the result of the referendum. And then there's the rest of us. We're currently in the European Union with some opt-outs. Most of them will be happy to be outside the European Union with some opt-ins. Let's just get on with it. And that, in, in a sense, is the argument for a deal. But am I, am I right that the time it takes in order to, assuming there is a deal, that it is possible, it's not looking tremendously hopeful at the moment, um, and assuming there's not any of the other options, the, the time to negotiate in agriculture for the terms which protect high quality food, which protect what Minette was talking about, producers who are producing high quality but at non-competitive international rates, that doesn't happen overnight, those no, deals. Absolutely. I don't want to hog the microphone, but you're absolutely right. Uh, there is a transition period. Of course, if there's no deal, there is no transition period. On the 1st of November, bang. And uh, that transition period is not terribly long. It may be required to have certain sectoral uh, elements which will require a, a, a softer landing. Uh, but, you know, we need to, we need to be... Uh, it's like a divorce. We're not going to walk out of the door and leave the kids and the CDs and everything like that. We've got to... This has got to be a sensible arrangement for the long term, and that may take a long time, and we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be uh, prissy about saying that. We should say, it, this is complicated, uh, trust us, we'll get there. And I think most people, whether they voted remain or leave, are the top of that bell curve, and they would understand. Thank you. Uh, professor, looking at it with the detachment of a scientist... Um, or well, not, as the case may be. Well, I pray to Darwin every day that we do not leave the European Union, but, um, and I, I think I can say that. Uh, yeah, um, but thinking if we are, you know, if, if we don't have tariffs and we don't protect our farmers, we're taking one hand, tying it behind their back and telling them to go and bat for England, you know, and that's challenging enough most of the time. So we've, we've, got to, we've got to set where our red lines are. And there's many, many red lines of what we want our agriculture and our food production systems to be. You know, the first red line, we don't want any more uh, deforestation globally. We want to maintain the Amazon. We want to maintain the steppes, the Pampinas, the rich, diverse land. So therefore, we've got to efficiently utilize the agricultural land that we have, both arable and grazing. So that's critical, the first red line. And then I speak to my colleagues at Harpenden as part of Rothamsted Research, and I always joke to them, actually, that sustainable inter intensification of arable systems is easy. You just grow more in less area looking at use of soil. But for livestock, it's a lot more complex because they're sentient beings and we have welfare standards. And we're bloody good in this country at maintaining welfare standards and thinking about animals as sentient beings. I, I for one, would stop eating beef if I thought for one second that it would be importing animals into this country that have to rely on tylosin to stop subacute ruminal acidosis or even lactic acid acidosis causing liver abscesses. 
And that's happening all the time in many, many production practices on feedlot beef systems, which require the use of an antibiotic to stop liver abscesses. Okay. We've got to have red lines. We've got to have protection mechanisms. We cannot have this completely different types of agriculture where we care for the environment, we care for animal welfare, and then we just sell it away. Brexit or no Brexit, we need to develop a new means of ensuring that farmers in one country, say this country, who operate to, uh, who address climate change and operate to higher environmental standards are not disadvantaged by imports that are produced to lower standards. And I think it's a bit like the Paris uh, uh, COP21 agreement. It's that big a deal, this. Because if we're gonna lead, and we need to lead, we need to create um, a harmony, an internationally harmonized system for making sure that if farming, farming imports are produced to lower standards, the financial penalty for the producer who's importing is, is consistent with the higher costs which are lit, uh, legitimately um, incurred by our farmers. And I think that could be done globally as long as we have a harmonized framework for measuring sustainability and we could lead the world in that. It doesn't make any difference whether you Brexit or no Brexit, this is needed now. It's needed in the European Union as well. We are three years on from that referendum and what do we know? Uh, we know that Brexit is a more complicated deal than anyone imagined. There is new information about the costs to our society and our economy uh, and there, we know where there will be sectoral losers as well as potential winners uh, and we also know that parliamentary is parliamentary democracy has failed the people in this we've not managed to get a deal i cannot see a numerical outcome in the current parliament that will deliver any deal on brexit so I've had to sort of strip my own thinking back to the sort of elemental core of uh, what this is about. Uh, and in the context of the Labour Party, a social democratic, democratic socialist party, I now believe that the EU is the institutional expression of Labour internationalism. If you're in a global economy, you need international collaboration to reach common standards. And I think that is an emerging discussion in the country. So the only way I think we can break this on pass is by taking this back to the people and asking them to take a look at whatever deal Boris Johnson uh, negotiates if he wins the leadership of the Conservative Party. And I want my party to campaign for remaining within the EU. Uh, because I think that is the only way I think it is the only way you're going to answer these problems of common standards. You know, when I met the egg people this week, what are they terrified about? Ukrainian imports of eggs into the 25% of industry uh, that does food production. I now know, I didn't know this before I met them, that an egg only retains its integrity whilst it's in the shell. Uh, and if you bring all these eggs in and stick them in the food processor and it ends up in McDonald's burgers, it loses its integrity. I, I want my eggs made in Britain because I trust British farmers. I, I want them to adhere to proper welfare standards. And there is a million other bits of agriculture in the same boat. We'll never sort this out. We'll never sort this out. And that's why we need a referendum and we should campaign to remain. I'm torn between wanting to pursue with the politicians the implications of what they said. Like, I want to ask Tom, you want a referendum. Do you think you're ever going to persuade your leader that there should be a referendum? Um, well, I'm trying. You're trying. You probably noticed that. I, did, I have noticed it. And, and I wanted to ask Richard if uh, the, his last choice does emerge as looks likely as leader of his party, and goes for a no deal option because he's determined to do it by October the 31st. In terms of protecting agriculture and everything else, would you at that point say, I will vote for anything that can get us away from no deal, whatever that may be, even if one of those options is another referendum? 
Well, I haven't. Sorry, we've got to type. Do you mind uh, you for a second? Uh, no. I haven't been uh, the best friend of my whips in recent months, so uh, anything is possible, but not, I don't, I'm afraid, a second referendum. All I can tell you about a second referendum is that whatever the result, the campaign for the third referendum will start the next day. And uh, I, I, I don't want a never end them, uh, and I just think we can sort this out. But. Uh, uh, I will see what my new leader, who you all seem to assume is one person, that may not be the case. And, but I'm the kiss of death on this. Everybody I've, uh, I've supported has, has, has died on their ass. And so, uh, uh, so, so uh, that might be why Jeremy Hunt has been rather sort of cold with me lately. <laughs> well, we've come to the end of our allotted time and there has to be lunch. So thank you for the kiss of life that we've all had from our five panelists. Um, I'm sorry, I'm, there's lots to discuss more, but I hope that's been useful and it's been enjoyable and stimulating. Thanks very much. <laughs>